Okay, so look, I'd like to welcome you all today to, in, to our event in conversation with Iman Nur Wursain. Thank you, Iman, for coming. Um, my name is Lil Kennedy, and I'm from Student Wellbeing, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, on behalf of Student Wellbeing, I would like to welcome you all here today, including those who are viewing this from other campuses. So we're, we're um, live streaming to the regions. That's really good. I hope they have managed to con connect in. Um, I also want to start today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the custodians of the land on, on which Melbourne campus is based. And we want to pay our respects to their elders, past and present and future. Um, I don't know how many of you, but I hope you've been enjoying the celebrations around the Pride Festival this week. I think there's been lots of activity and I think it was really fun yesterday. We had a great time and it's continuing today and there's been lovely music happening on the lawn and so it's been really, really good spirit. Um, I think given the Harmony Day la last week and Pride today, it really fits with the theme for this event, which is community through diversity and I think it's really proven that La Trobe and our community benefit from, from our diversity. So I just want to make that point. Um, and I think this, the topic that we have today also really fits in with that team. And um, Nora will talk more about, and our panelists will talk more about the intersexuality of faith and sexuality and gender. Um, I'd just like to start by introducing Timothy William Jones who is going to chair this event. And Timothy is a historian and also has an interest in relig um, religion, gender, and sexuality. Correct? Am I right? OK. Thanks very much, Thul. Um, before I introduce our speaker and panel, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, because it's being filmed, if any of you are shy about being on camera, the backs of your heads will, will be all that might be seen. Um, but if you're even shy about that, can I encourage you to sit in the back rows and then you'll be completely anonymous. All right. Uh, today, uh, our much anticipated speaker, uh, Imam Noor Wasami, will speak first, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions uh, after the panel, uh, with our panel. So I'll invite our panel to comment and then open it up to the floor uh, for a more general discussion. So on our panel, we have Dr. Carol de Cruz. Uh, Carol's a senior lecturer. Uh, uh, at La Trobe and has been working uh, in gender, sexuality and diversity studies since 2007. Uh, she's the author of Identity Politics in Deconstruction, Calculating with the Incalculable uh, and co-editor co of the anthology After Homosexual, The Legacies of Gay Liberation, uh, commemorating the work of uh, our own Dennis Altman. Uh, please welcome Carol de Cruz. <laughs> Our second pan uh, panel member is Professor Helen Lee. Helen's research is focused on the people of Tonga in the South Pacific and Tongans who've migrated and settled in countries such as Australia. Her main focus has been questions of cultural identity, belonging, and especially the ways in which identity is formed by young people and children. Please welcome Professor Helen Lee. Uh, Imam Noor specifically requested uh, Carol and Helen join him on stage today as they were well-respected teachers uh, of Noor when he was studying here at La Trobe. Um, I'm not sure how many years ago, only just the other day, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Imam Noor Wasami, originally from Somalia and now residing in Melbourne, is Australia's first and only openly gay Imam. He has an extraordinary depth of knowledge of Islamic scripture, uh, one of the few people who's memorised the entire Quran in Arabic. Noor is able to use this knowledge to credibly challenge conservative interpretations of Islamic texts uh, and is actively helping queer Muslim people to reconcile their faith and sexuality or gender through his queer Muslim support group, Mahaba. The importance of this work cannot be overstated. And I think the, its importance spreads beyond the Muslim community. Other religious people seeing um, Muslims working out their faith and sexuality get inspiration from your work, Noor. Um, I do. Uh, the amount of courage required for a Muslim man to come out as gay, let alone a public Muslim religious leader like Noor, is significant and costly and humbling to reflect upon. His courage gained the attention of the Manette Horwitz Trust in the United States, who presented him with a Courage Award in 2017. Many of us are not fully aware of the challenges that Muslim queer people face, the fears, the consequences of coming out, and the internal conflicts and tension between queerness and religion that are agonizingly present for this part of our community. 
Stories like Imam Noor's are not stories that we commonly hear, and we're privileged to hear them today. Please welcome Imam Noor Basami. Thank you very much, um, Tim. Um, first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, pay my respects to all elders past and present. Um, secondly, it is a great honor to be here. I thank um, the counseling department for inviting me, La Trobe University. And also, I am very humbled to have two of my greatest teachers, um, in fact, idols of mine, um, to be on a panel with me. I was saying to one of my friends, I think I have been doing something right to have my teachers on the panel. So thank you very much for agreeing to, um, to be joining me. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with you, when I came out publicly, it would have been 2010. Um, I analyzed the risks, the consequences. I know my people intimately. I have been active as an imam in Melbourne since probably 2000, 2001, just after year 12. I was the school captain in my um, Islamic school in um, Spring Valley in the second half of year 11 and throughout year 12. I was also the imam in my school, but then requests started coming from local, um, my local mosque because there were not people that were I wasn't a Hafiz back then, but there were not many people that were well versed in the Quran, so they wrote a letter to my principal back then requesting that I, I get allowed to leave one Friday in a month, out of four Fridays in a month, to give the Friday sermons. Reluctantly, my principal um, agreed. So, coming out in 2010, and particularly starting um, Marhaba in November 2013, I knew the um, consequences that that would have on me personally, on my family, and on um, the community that I have been leading for many years. However, those were risks that I was willing to live with. I don't think of myself as courageous, even the word it was humbling. I still don't think of myself as courageous. I thought, how can I use my story to try to make a difference? Coming to La Trobe and particularly learning um, uh, gender and sexuality studies, um, in the beginning with Dr. Carroll, it somehow revolutionized my life because it was terminologies and also from Professor Helen Lee, terminologies that were just fascinating for me. I came from a background as an imam, and I am a person who's half as, and I studied what's called tafsir, the commentary of the Quran. So some of the words that I learned here were just, even though I haven't finished, it is to be finished, to be continued, <laughs> and soon, I hope, um, were just revolutionary. Ways of seeing, for example, um, was a lecture that I will never forget. I often, I even um, from Professor Helen Lee, I still have some of those um, notes, uh, even though I didn't attend most of the lectures, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I kept them. I printed them all out, and you know, every now and then I would, I would look at them. So it was, um, I took a leap in November 2013. Um, I didn't know where I was going to land. I thought carefully of the risks and the consequences. However, I never thought that it was going to save lives that leap. I never thought the impact that it would have on a global scale. It started from my humble lounge room with a geriatric American bulldog who's gone to God now, Chico, God bless his soul, um, staring at me, you know. Um, but I thought, okay, it was particularly in, uh, specifically in November 22nd of 2013. Um, from my humble lounge room. Within the first year, the impact was just national. It was marhaba, you see the email, dot Melbourne. I said, we can keep it as that, dot Melbourne, because that's where we started. But the impact was national, families reaching out. Um, the last count that we did was in um, January of last year. And it was 1,800 people that I alone dealt with. And I am one man with very limited means. 
800 individuals that because of a platform, an idea that I had, I facilitated a platform that we could have these discussions of sexuality and spirituality. I said I didn't know, and I still don't know how to reconcile the two for many individuals, but I said let's just um, talk about it in a safe environment where people will not be targeted. Um, so safety was um, something that was always in my mind, and I must thank Victoria Police. Gabby, you know, you have been a great um, pillar of support. You were there from day one um, in our first meeting, if you remember. Um, it gave a lot of confidence to young people that we're going back to the trauma, the environment that was causing the trauma to come and, okay, there's others like us. Um, a Pakistani couple, um, a sister who ha is in a relationship, she said, I never thought they were the Pakistani lesbians. Just by having, coming to um, social dinners that we facilitated on a monthly basis. People were, being, were paranoid about seeing others. So a Somalian person who's gay or lesbian will be paranoid about seeing another Somalian person who's gay. I said, but why? You're the same. Um, so that was, you know, to manage the dynamics of the group um, was interesting to say the least. Um, but, you know, I didn't have a manual. The only thing that I had was, you know, the knowledge that I studied and the knowledge that I received from um, attending here with Carol and other lecturers and Professor Helen Lee as well. So, um, sexuality and spirituality, I think, are but two qualities that make a person who they are. You know, I often, with the media, brouhaha, they referred to me as Australia's first gay imam. I said, I wonder would the same bruja has been done, have been done about Australia's first straight imam. Um, but then I thought, okay, it's probably because of the trauma that LGBT people have gone through throughout um, our history. And it's a very important topic and I constantly, um, I feel privileged talking about it because if you look in our history, um, throughout our history as a human species, there have always been people that stood out or stood up against the status quo and um, initiated change. And in our lifetime, at least in my lifetime, um, it has been the queer community. Um, so it is a topic uh, that is some, you know, it, I feel very humble to speak about always. However, there is still a lot of work. Um, last night only I was speaking to a Somalian boy who was taken out of um, his um, country of birth in Holland, never left the country, um, was lied to by the parents, took him to all the way in Somalia and has been stuck there for five years. Um, physically assaulted, um, broken teeth. For a family member to abuse a child simply because they do not um, understand their sexuality, that is something that is unforgivable. Um, and I'm a man of God, I believe in God. I think that is something that all parents will be accountable for um, in front of God, because it's a gift. And in Arabic, there's a saying, um, a إِذَا فُقِدَتْ عُرِفَتْ A gift that one has, only when they lose it, they will understand its value. We don't understand the value of eyesight, ask a blind person. We do not ask, we do not value the gift of children. But at that moment of um, death for parents, and you know, every parent would want to be buried by their child, the worst thing that can happen to any parent um, is to bury their child. It happened to our family. We almost lost my mother. The worst thing that can happen. However, some parents, you know, I think they, that rite of passage, they do not see this new life as a separate life. I remember a Somalian mother who came visited me last year, all the way from um, the western suburbs to South Yara, driving the Tarago, and came and said, I want my son back. The son somehow decided to come out on Facebook with all uncles on there. I said, why would you do that? Um, because you know, you're dealing with um, a mentality that does not understand um, gender and sexuality. There's a binary code, you know, when it comes to um, identity. 
So anyway, after a few months, she said, I want my son back, Sheikh. So I said, okay, come, let's talk about it. We helped him, we found accommodation, and um, emergency accommodation. And then after that, he found stable accommodation. And then she reached out somehow, she found my details. And we talked about the son. Um, as, um, I said, tell me about this boy. You gave, she said, oh, Sheikh, he's gay. I said, mama, just forget the gay thing. And I was using my phone. I said. And I was sitting on the passenger side of the Tarago. I said, this is the gay thing. And I took the phone out. I said, tell me about this boy. You carried him for nine months. You gave birth to him. You fed him. You. And then this mother just, you know, fell, um, you know, started crying. Oh, he was such a nice boy. He did the best for me. He loved me. He used to help me with the shopping. He was the best among his siblings. I said, you forgot all of that. And you're focused on this, the one gay issue. It is one, but one of two qualities, spirituality and sexuality, that make us um, who we are, among many, many other qualities. Then it dawned upon me. I said, but why do you overlook all these qualities? She said, oh, but Sheikh, he's not going to give me grandchildren. A modification of children. Um, so then I thought, OK, at least there's a step. Um, she came and reached out. So there is a great need, my dear friends. Um, I thought, how can I use my journey? I never thought, um, I thought of the risks and the, th the threats came within the first year to my front door. Um, I thought carefully of them. Um, a teacher of mine, Lana Musa, who passed away, he used to always tell us to analyze before we take a step a decision in, any, in anything in life, he used to ask us to think of a thousand outcomes. And he would always make us start with worst case scenario. Um, and actually, he would make us write them down. Um, we never reached even a hundred. But the first worst case scenario for me was death. Because you're dealing with the mentality that says recently the Australian National Board of Imams, gerontocrats. You know the term? Anybody doesn't know it? Gerontocracy? Everyone knows it? Anyone doesn't know? Government by old men. Um, and we have that within all religious um, hierarchies. They issued the statement, and I said, well, at least this. I thought, what happened? There's all this silence. Marhaba will be five years this year. November will be five years. So they issued the statement saying, you know, it's a major sin major sin. And that's half of a fatwa, continuation of it, major sin, punishable by death. Repentance of it is death, your repentance. So this is the wrong way of reading scriptures. You're dealing with scriptures that are um, 7th century, 8th century. And one must give, um, you know, we have experts here. We come to the experts when we want to learn. Why is it that when everybody le reads the Bible and they read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, each one is a grand mufti and an archbishop, and they issue verdicts on their children? On their children, forget other people. So I thought, how can I use my story and the Quran that I have learned to find a way of reinterpreting this story in a mo more contemporary uh, format? Um, every religion, I think the three Abrahamic religions, we have the story in common, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I believe that um, the reason that homosexuality is looked at as a threat, I mean, interestingly, in Islam, um, there are clear-cut scriptures that talk about interest, riba. Many Muslims will say, oh, but Sheikh, if it's the first family home, it's justified. So we found just the clear-cut, several uh, references. When it comes to alcohol drinking, they say, oh, but the person is going through a phase and they will get uh, out of it. However, there is nothing that says you should reject your child or you should throw them off buildings or something like that. But I often thought, why is the reaction so aggressive? And then, I mean, you can correct me, Carol, I think it's because homosexuality, queer people, we are a threat to this patriarchal thing. You know, um, I remember a family member would never enter a kitchen because that's where women be. You know, um, I sit in the table, she bring, cooks, and I, you know, whereas you see a gay couple, one washes the dishes, the other one dries them. 
you know, um, so it's a threat to this patriarchal um, setup, and that's why any threat to that um, patriarchy is to be made an example of publicly. Um, so I think spiritually, though, that is incorrect. And in the Quran, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the term homosexuality is non-existent. You know, there are more clear um, references in the Bible, but in the Quran, the term homosexuality is non-existent. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah and Prophet Lut السلام, is used to justify that. And when you look at the story through the books of tafsir, the books of commentary, it wasn't homosexuality that these people were involved in. It was acts of rape, which still happens now. I come from Somalian background. Somalia is the only country in the whole of Africa that is Muslim. There's not even sects. There is all Sunni. They, probably some overseas have changed, but in the country. Yet, um, the worst civil war in our history has been happening there since 1990. We have tribalism there. Tribal, tribalism. And when one tribe wages war on another tribe, these are all Muslim people, by the way, all Muslim, all same sect, Sunni, but when they would wage war on another village, they would rape men, women, children, everything that moves. It was a war strategy that still happens till this day in my home country of Somalia, original country of Somalia. It happens in different parts in Africa and so forth. So it was that act. And some scholars of tafsir, they say it was that act. And they were apparently um, Sodom and Gomorrah, the first people. Some scholars of commentary say that they were the first people that were involved in this act of waging war. Two villages on either side of, I think, uh, the Dead Sea, where the Jordan River is. Um, and they would attack each other and do this. So Lot came to them and said, no, this is wrong. And then we have totally changed that to um, um, hurt young people. We have a tragedy in our country, my dear friends, um, respected teachers. We have four million people with mental health, and it's on the rise in our country. Um, I like to refer to it as an avalanche of misery coming into psychiatric um, wards and emergency departments. A lot of it are young people. A lot of it is young people. And the trauma is generally starting from homes. So I said, OK, you know, in academia, we are taught original thoughts. So I thought that night when I started on 22nd of November, I said, how can I do something to get into the homes? I mean, I was really nervous. I was, you know, this courage award was a big shock to me when I received it. But I was really, you know, pooping myself, so to speak. Because I said, what? <laughs> really? Because, you know, our people would just take one nut person to come and say, I will do it, you know? So I thought, OK, you know. Wait, then the media started, we started getting invites. Look, just hold on, wait, let's build a group. And, you know, as I was saying, Gabi and Victoria Police, you have attended several times. It gave a lot of confidence to the young people just to see um, Victoria Police's presence. But then I said, okay, wait, wait. You know, Joy FM was calling. There was other media outlets. But I said, we're not established yet. And my idea was not to, um, uh, is it the mic? Um, my idea was not publicity and that. My idea was to provide healing to de manage the trauma. It is irreversible, the trauma that families do to their loved ones. Irreversible. Um, I think Professor Lee, once I, one of the terms I learned um, in my classes were interference. Interference that um, as the child is being brought up, you know, I remember once a father... I was called to a walima, a seven days, um, when a child is seven days old, you know, they, uh, um, that's the day that the name is chosen. Generally, the names are chosen anyway, but there's this celebration. And this seven day old, seven days, one week, boy, the father picks him up, says, Sheikh, Imam, look, doesn't he look like a doctor? <laughs> and that interference, I think, when I learned from Professor Lee was, I'm thinking, oh, wow. And then boys don't cry, men don't cry, you know. And then you have this um, uh, repressed, or it's a way that you have been taught how to be, and you can't even express your emotions. So for me, I was meeting with uh, an official yesterday who said, 
You know, I, it was through science that I um, found um, atheism. I said, for me, as a person who came from an Islamic background and as an imam, it was through science that I found the reconciliation of my um, spirituality and sexuality. Because, like I said, coming here and learning some so those terminologies, I said, wow, okay, you know, it's not only, I said, wow, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then, you know, one must seek therapy as well. So I, but I wasn't, if I ever call myself courageous, it's because I was not willing to, I always stood up to the injustice. I copped a lot of hiding, I got into a lot of trouble for it from mm -hmm. our elders and our mosques and communities. But I always just was questioning, but why? But why? But why? You know? Um, says, Shh, no, don't. Even when I was on the board of Imam Zero of Victoria, you know, there was 36 of us. I can refer the other 35 to some Neanderthal rocks that should have been extinct. Um, but they're there, and running mosques with thousands of young people and, you know, um, damaging young people. So I thought, Two things I had a problem with, and I will finish. Um, two things I had a problem with. I had a problem with young people that were saying, look, I reject faith. You know, this God who's telling me. I said, God's not telling you this. It is people telling you this. So I had a problem with that. Young people who would be rejecting the faith. Of all faiths, not only Islam, of all faiths. Might have initially started for Muslims there. We had George. Good to see you. <laughs> um, we had all other um, faiths. We had people who had partners would come and they would say, I mean, a Jewish um, person who was in a um, same-sex relationship with one of our members said, oh, Nur, Nur, you have restored the faith back. I said, but we haven't talked about the Torah at all. You know, um, but um, I had a problem with people rejecting one part of their identity simply because of what people dictated to them. And the second thing I had a problem with was um, people doing what I did, got married. I mean, I never led the double life. I, you know, I had um, a beautiful, loving marriage for one year. And I have a beautiful child that came out of that marriage. But I had a problem, and you know, within one year, I said, look, I can't do this. Because I was told it will disappear. It will go, it never went away. In fact, it was like this, 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 this more. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, I broke this young girl who loved me. I broke her heart, you know, because I brought an innocent person because of, again, what people were telling me into my web of lies. Um, took some time, but alhamdulillah, now we are, thankfully, we are good friends and she has forgiven me. It took some time, though. But I had a problem with people that were doing that and leading a double life. You know, as an imam, I have seen many men who would be married, the wife would be at home, one with a litter of children, one, two, three, four, five, paralyze the woman in the house, and then go do um, the um, uh, double life, whatever they were doing in saunas and gay clubs and that. I said, but you have a family in here. What do you do? He said, oh, Sheikh, you know, it's okay, don't. If they don't know, they don't know. So I had a problem with those two things. So I thought, how can we facilitate something we forget, I mean, marhaba, we always mentioned in the beginning, it's a way of reconciling the two. But I said, if we don't even talk about it, how do we find ways of reconciling? You will not find any of the imams, whether it's in Victoria, whether it's in New South Wales, whether it's national or Pacific wide, you will not find any imams that will sit in a, a discussion like this and have just a, a normal discussion about sexuality and spirituality because it's a taboo in um, use of language. In 70 countries, everyone that is um, sitting here will simply be imprisoned for the simple fact that you're sitting here because of sexuality. Ten of those countries, Somalia, my country of origin is one, um, LGBT people are executed. So there's still a lot of work, you know, there is still a lot of work and I think the work that I did from 2001 till 2013 as an imam who was closeted imam, um, if I compare to what we have achieved from 2013 since Marhaba started till now, the achievements from 2013 till now will outweigh the others that, um, for all those years. It saved lives. Um, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Several people contacted. They said, just seeing your story, one person, I will end with this example, one person who is of my country of origin, 
contacted me after they saw the project um, story. And, you know, the media platform for me, it was a strategic move. Um, the cameraman was paid, the interviewee was paid, um, everyone was paid. I went there just on a voluntary. Um, they said, we don't pay um, for interviews. I said, all right, lovely. Um, <laughs> but so you're all paid. Um, but it was a strategic move because I thought, how can I get this message into homes? And the project story, for example, was one that really touched my heart, not necessarily the Channel 10, but um, it was a person who called from Minnesota in America, a young Somalian man who was a pharmacology student, and he said, look, Noor, had this story been done one day late, he said, I wouldn't have been here. So I was sitting um, at home, I said, where were you going, back to Somalia? He said, no, no. He said, he actually chose the day, the method, and he said, I was not planning to um, survive it. That night, I didn't sleep. So now, I have my doctor said to me, Nur, you have to have medication, because I call people sometimes at 4 a.m., what's next, 5 a.m., come on, you have something to, because there's still a lot of work. Um, so uh, it wakes me up, it is something I'm really passionate about. And it has, as I said, saved lives, provided healing. And La Trobe Uni and Carol de Cruz and Professor Helen Lee, you were instrumental in my journey. So thank you very much um, for inviting me. And thank you. Thank you so much, Noor. That's uh, a really humbling story. And one, um, as you indicated, Mahaba, I didn't know that Mahaba had uh, moved to helping people beyond Islam. Um, but certainly your story is very inspirational to all people struggling with religion and sexuality. Um, now I'll invite uh, Helen and Carol to respond. <laughs> <laughs> You're never in trouble. Um, yeah. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Is this working? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, and it goes to show that even when students don't complete courses they can be amazing you can still go on to do amazing things and you still learn um, there's two things that I would like to pick up on what you were saying one was lived experience and the other was um, the words reconciliation and what's reconcilable uh, lived experience I think for anyone who's brought up with any kind of faith and um, is given uh, way of thinking about sexuality through that faith um, means that at different points in time the way you're going to make sense of sex and sexuality is going to be within that frame. Um, so I can compare some things with you. I was actually brought up Catholic and um, in that frame sex is uh, positioned as sinful if it's not within the bounds of marriage uh, sex without love um, is incomprehensible and then sex um, in saunas, sex um, in chance encounters, you know, sex for your one-nighters and the hell of it and wherever your desire might go, which is perfectly okay most of the time within, you know, uh, we've got to put some caveats, but, you know, <laughs> we have some caveats with sex, but that's off the radar. So making sense of a sexual self when that is the grid you are given can be really hard and accessing knowledge to make sense of desire can be hard to access. Some of us don't reach that point till we come to university or we have a chance encounter with somebody who's leading a very different life. And so it's important for us to tell those parts of our story. And the thing that I loved about your speech as well is how you linked that to what education can do, what revolutionary concepts can do for our understanding of making sense of lived experience and the importance of that, which includes how you interpret holy books. It includes learning the history um, of the word homosexuality, which is not in the Bible either, um, by the way. <laughs> um, the word only came into being in the 19th century. 
you know. So, so those sorts of things really help us with lived experience. The other thing I want to pick up um, from what you said was a moment it, in which you said, I'm not sure if faith and sexuality are reconcilable. And I think that's great that you said that. Because for as much as you spoke about um, reconciling things through conversation, I'm glad that you actually noticed that um, things don't reconcile. This is the world that we're living in. And um, part of learning is to actually work with the disjuncture. And I take both faith and sexuality as things are, that both things are evolving in a world that's historically messy and politically corrupt and awful and wrong. And so focusing on what isn't reconcilable I think is actually very good for us because it shows us where we need to struggle and that all of these things involve work. So thank you for saying those two things and thank you for inviting us today. Thank you so much again for inviting us today. We really appreciate that. And I actually want to correct something that you said, which is that you did actually come to classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you were one of my more engaged students, which is always a blessing, as many of you know, that you actually get students that want to learn and are interested in what you're talking about. And one of the things, I teach anthropology, and in my first class of my first year subject, one of the things that I say to the students is that there are no universal definitions of what's normal or natural or proper or right, and that for every example that they can give me of something is normal or natural, I can give them a cultural exception to that, which really starts to turn their ideas around. And, to, and we, in anthropology, we talk a lot about the cultural construction of ideas. And I think in your work, what you're doing is you're being one of those brave people who actually challenge cultural constructions, who uh, are prepared to contest those kinds of things that people take for granted that they see as just that's how things are and question that and that often takes a lot of bravery so I applaud you in that. Thanks. Thanks Helen. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes uh, if anyone in the audience uh, has questions. Um, there's some microphones up here. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask Noor or the other panellists? We've got a straight away one at the front there. Will. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noor. That was a wonderful talk, very inspiring. Um, I have a question. It comes back to the issue of faith and spirit, uh, sexuality. You actually never used the term faith. You didn't even use the term religion. You, ter you said you believe in God, but you, I think, consciously used the term spirituality. And I was wondering if you could explain that choice of terms, please. You know, when I started Marhaba, the name, I didn't want anything to do with religion. Um, because it was precisely what the trauma, uh, the cause of the trauma that I was thinking of ways of managing. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, and historically, you know, I was mentioning yesterday to a friend that um, historically religion has killed the most number of people um, in our history as a species, and we're looking for cure for cancer. Um, so religion, religious institutions, I think it's something that initially started okay. It started with good intentions, but as um, things progressed, um, it has been exploited. It has been, uh, I was mentioning to one official in the housing department, I said, how, how would we manage the housing crisis? I said, very simple, very simple. Confiscate all the church buildings, all the temples and because they get close, but oh no, but human rights, but how about the rights of the people in the streets? All these big buildings and the temples and the mosques that are closed down, house them in there. Very simple solution. Um, so I s keep away from all organized religion, I think, including Islam. It has been, um, I'm a Muslim, I'm a man of um, faith, as I said, that it has done a lot of damage. So I try to um, refer to spirituality rather than um, religion. I hope that answers it. Does anyone else have any questions? So um, 
I I don't think that in Islam um, people should kill um, other people from the LGBT community and I think it's a really terrible thing that's going on but um, I want to ask why do you say that your interpretation of Quran um, and the tafsir um, of uh, Nabi Lot and um, this story is correct based on your interpretation and not other people's interpretation. How do you say that it's because of rape and not because of homosexuality? Interpretation, it is one of the oldest um, interpreters, Mufassirin, uh, that have existed. Unfortunately, now we have a particular um, set of interpreters that have flooded Islamic institutions. I was in Al-Azhar University you know, Ibn Kathir, Suyuti, and it's limited. But when you look back into, for example, uh, Tabari, uh, Imam Tabari's tafsir um, is where I got this from. It was, uh, so it's not my interpretation, it is one of the oldest. If not, I think it is the oldest, um, uh, one of the oldest Mufassirin um, commentators out there. So that is where my reference is from. And you, ha I think, um, is about, 37 volumes of that tafsir, and only a few of those volumes have been translated into English. So if you can get hold of them, I recommend it. Um, tafsir of Tabari and even Tafsir of Qurtubi. Both of those I recommend it to you. I wanted to add that, um, do you agree that in Islam, um, any relationships between any two people um, I mean, sexual relationships uh, or romantic even relationships have to come after marriage or not? And if so, then has there been any um, thing talking in Islam about, um, for example, two gay men getting married or two lesbian women getting married? Um, look, when you look back in the history of humanity, as people progress, things change, and we have this mujaddidin, um, uh, reformation, you know, tajdid, Islam reforms. So even historically, when you look back to even some of the commentaries um, in the Quran, when you read the story of Adam and Eve, when Qabil and Habil, Abel and Cain, the two brothers, um, one killed the other, their um, constitution, or so to speak, their sharia back then, was Eve used to give, and this is one reference, of, and you have a look at that, Ibn Kathir, which is very common to ease and very readily available in English. Ibn Kathir says that their sharia, their rule back then, Eve would give birth to a set of twins, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl. Hence, we increase the numbers. Their rule back then was the boy from the first set, gets married to the girl from the second set, and vice versa, vice versa. If you propose such an idea now, what do you think? Um, so things change, and you know, we are all fallible. We cannot say, someone said to one of our members, is that, these are just um, temptations, don't act on it. It's nonsense. Which young person doesn't check pornography and you know, hasn't got, whether they're straight or whether they are. So we, all do this it is not um, I think what is um, frowned upon is when people become promiscuous and it's sometimes used as a way of masking a particular trauma I recently returned from Sydney um, and this was one of the greatest honors uh, Carol and Helen I, this today is one of my greatest honors as well I sat on a panel with the 78ers um, yeah my god and I went, yes, I couldn't believe it. I cried. The, the 78ers are the first people who marched in the first yes, Mardi Gras yes. in Australia. And I saw, I mean, I went and, uh, and the irony, the prison, the Surrey Hills police station where they put them in the, I wasn't even born back then, by the way. <laughs> um, to be on a panel with such um, icons was just humbling. I saw the prison and I prayed around there, but they turned the, not prison, the police station into a mental um, health institution. Said I would have demolished the whole building and turned it into a park or something. Um, so I think we have likes, dislikes. We have, um, you know, 
I believe that on a spiritual level, there's the concept of ruh, soul in Islam. And there's a verse in the Quran where they came and asked Muhammad, tell us about the soul. He said, the soul is something that is of my God. We cannot understand it. Um, and I think all of us are these spiritual creatures. So to put a binary code on this is how you should be and this is how it should be. And historically, forever, it's um, something that is, uh, I think, uh, unspiritual. And it's not, um, you cannot box a, a soul that is to be linked with, um, to go back to ultimately the source, which is Allah Almighty God. I hope that answers you. Um, it's an interesting question. I was thinking, um, I've done a lot of work on the history of Christianity and sodomy, uh, and it's in parallel in, in Christian tradition. Uh, it's not until a thousand years uh, after Christ that sodomy starts to be interpreted predominantly as a sexual sin, not as a, a sin of violence. Um, if anyone else has a question, put up your hand, but I have a question which I'm going to sneak in. <laughs> um, um, you said towards the end that one, there were two things that you uh, didn't like, people living a double life, but also people thinking that they couldn't um, reconcile or live with uh, being spiritual and being queer. Um, I was speaking to uh, someone who leads, as part of my research, a group of uh, Christians, uh, survivors of, of gay conversion therapy, um, you know, who've gone through quite traumatic processes because of their struggle to reconcile their religious and sexual identities uh, and he said for some people in their group uh, being spiritual is too hard and it's he says don't worry about it for now just be safe um, is that can you comment on that the difficulties of uh, when, you, when you've gone through traumatic experiences trying to reconcile your religion and your sexuality um, do, do you think it's okay to give up on religion for a bit Recently, I um, returned from, I was invited to speak in uh, a hospital in Queensland. They were looking after a woman, that a Somalian sister who came and they needed an interpreter, so interpreting job opportunity. And then I went there for that job. They said, oh, look, welcome. Give us a talk. <laughs> um, so I said, no problem. But the interesting thing, this sister went through something that is very close to my heart. Um, process procedure which is called FGM, female genital mutilation. My mother have gone, has gone through that. In fact, I wanted to um, show a video today and one of my friends, an artist, said, no, no, don't do that, you traumatize the people. But I said, it's on YouTube. Um, my sister went through it. The damage that does, um, again, on a physiological level is just, um, and to justify that in the name of God, you know, I mean, my f and mothers standing there in the background, um, doing a little, 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 celebrating as if it's, um, and the father says, my father said, till this day, he said, it was bin taharha, we are purifying her. Um, but what I found challenging to answer your question was when I went to this um, hospital in uh, Queensland, now physicians have a way of reversing this procedure. And the sister, I said to her, they said, look, Noor, we have put this to her, suggested to her. She said, oh, Noor, I don't want people to refer to me as a prostitute or something, so I would like to keep it. So I don't know if that's called the Stockholm Syndrome or if it's uh, something. With, so you would understand sometimes that damage. But through therapy, I think, and through education one can find I mean there isn't a, like Dr. Carol was saying there isn't a way of um, sometimes reconciling the two at all and I can understand um, very often when one lets go of the other because of the trauma that has been done a lot of I was um, interviewed by the um, Royal Commission people who were investigating the uh, child abuse um, cases and we had 11 people um, that have gone through this experience here in Melbourne by imams. Um, not one mention of it. They said, oh, no, we want to interview them. I said, these people are still people in their homes. 
they have this misguided concept of loyalty. I don't want to shame the family. I said, what um, steps are there to, if they come out publicly, what do you have in services to protect them and support them and house them? Oh, but we don't have such. I said, well, I cannot. But 11 people, I pleaded with them. They flew in from Sydney to see me in Tehran. I said, please make mention of it. It does exist. 11 victims of sexual abuse by women. But you would understand. And all 11 said we have rejected that. But they somehow want to talk about sexuality. and um, They found some sort of healing in sitting with people um, to say that, you know, you're not a sin. I don't know if Thank you. I mean, it's it's difficult. In the, the project that I'm working on, uh, looking at people who've gone through conversion therapy, uh, the people who've given up on their faith uh, have better mental health outcomes. Um, but the people that persist, that want to still believe, it's, it's hard work. I'm not saying it's impossible. They're, they're doing it, and I admire them a lot. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, but there's a cost. I've gone through, I remember um, Manny, Manny, for example, who was boy who was abused by the rabbi in Yeshiva College, he said each time he saw the rabbi standing at the door of that school, it just re-brought the... Um, so Repeated the trauma. Would, yeah, you would understand yeah. sometimes. Yeah. I'm, I've been a bad here and I've gone over time. Um, I could sit here talking with you. I'm sure we could all uh, sit here talking about, about these issues for, issues for a long time. Um, but uh, thank you, Imam, for uh, your courage in, in coming out and being visible and sharing with us so generously today. Um, and giving us some insight into the challenges faced by queer Muslim people uh, and, peop and people more broadly struggling to reconcile religion and sexuality. Um, Noor's uh, email is up there if anyone wants to get in touch with him, uh, mahabamelbourne at gmail.com. Thank you also to Noor's teachers for joining us on stage, uh, Dr. Carol de Cruz and Professor Helen Lee. Um, and now Davina, uh, our queer counsellor, has some final comments. Siobhan, thank you so much. You were also a great pillar of support when I was here. So thank you. I didn't forget. <laughs> Sorry. Lil is going to come up. Is Lil around? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Timothy. <laughs> thank you, Liz, to close this. I feel like we could just keep talking for hours. <laughs> yeah. um, we really wanted to have Imam Nurse speak last year. Um, so it's been about 18 months we've been like anyway so we were so excited we were ecstatic when uh, he was able to speak this year um, because as you heard today Im imam noah is no ordinary speaker uh, in my conversations with him on the phone to organize this i was really struck by his humility and his sincerity and his generosity um, and i shared with him my hopes that having him speak could empower some of our muslim students who may have not previously seen a way forward uh, with their sexuality or gender and religion or spirituality. And yeah, it seems like you just kind of opened another door by saying reconciliation isn't necessary, like we can still talk. Uh, and I was hoping that it would also give us, our allies, a deeper appreciation and sensitivity to the challenges faced by queer Muslim community members. So thank you so much, Nerf, for making this happen. I have a small token of our appreciation. Carolyn de Cruz as well. Thank you, Lil. Please thank you, Dr. Carolyn. <laughs> Professor Helen Lee, thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Timothy Willem Jones, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for making time to hear this diverse voice in our community. And for those of you who will need another Noah Fix soon, go on YouTube. There are a lot of interviews. You can hear a lot more. Um, and finally, uh, there are just two events left in our Pride Festival. So just to let you know, this afternoon, 3 p.m. is Queer Chat. So any LGBTI identifying students are welcome to come. Uh, and also at 5 p.m., there's a queer movie night that's been organized by the LTSU. Um, yeah, so. We have the venue for another half an hour, so if you want to um, head out through the doors, there'll be some tea and coffee and some biscuits if you want to mill around and talk for another half an hour. 
Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.